Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's add some energy to that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm excited to be with you this morning, share some best practices around the country. Uh, I do have the luxury in my background of working in corporate America as well as being an entrepreneur. And so I'll bring to you some thoughts and perspectives uh, because in my experience, size does not matter. So I'm gonna share with you how we turned around Oakwood Healthcare. I'm gonna share with you the accountability process and something about development that we were using at Harley Davidson. And I'm gonna share with you the same process around leadership development uh, that I've been using for the last 10 years working with entrepreneurs. And I've started and owned three businesses, sold one of them, and I've owned a franchise in my lifetime. And the reason I'm sharing that with you is if you understand franchising, you'll understand what it means to be able to build a business that is so efficient and productive and profitable that you can copy and paste it into any city you would like. Because that, those are the principles that franchising is born on. And so today I'm going to challenge you by the end of our time together to rethink one major business decision that can change the direction of your company or change your career forever. Um, as a tool to help do that, you have a handout that has some blanks on it. Mine has the answers, so that won't count on my memory. So there's a handout somewhere in front of you that has a few blanks. So as I go through a few slides and share some stories with you, fill in the blanks. So it'll serve as a nice little takeaway for you. Um, and at one point, there is a second uh, little handout that we'll reference in just a couple minutes. So today I'm gonna ask you to have one major takeaway. And uh, David, if you'd remind me at the end in case I forget to ask, I wanna make sure the audience got the takeaway. So let's dive in. So when I go inside of companies today, Jeffrey mentioned I was an instructor of other business advisors and business coaches around the world. Um, here's what I see when I go into businesses. 95% of the time, most of these issues. So I'm gonna kind of run through these kind of quickly so we can uh, proceed. Uh, number one, I find very few entrepreneurs today have a real well-designed strategic plan that is in alignment with what people are being held accountable for in the organization. So everybody understands how they contribute to the business success. I rarely see an effective plan. Number two, I find a shortage of talent. Not a shortage of people, a shortage of the right talent. We're gonna come back to the term right talent in a moment. I find inconsistent execution. I see profit, profitability charts when you look at trends, look like an EKG chart. They're up, they're down, they're up, they're down, they're good, up, 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 they're down, they're up. So what I'm gonna share with you is what have all my successful clients had in common to be able to make that trajectory of profitability more consistent over time. I find most talent in leadership positions, frontline supervisors, middle management, and senior leaders, I find most talent in leadership positions to be about average. Oh, there are a few rock stars sprinkled in, but on balance, I do not see great leadership teams and companies. I find very little attention, random, inconsistent, around systems and process. I told you I owned a franchise. Franchises are built on the principle, follow the system. I was at a factory where I studied, where we went benchmarking how French fries are made. And so it was incredible to see the process because they come into the plant in big giant train cars of potatoes. And somewhere in the plant, Burger King fries go this way and McDonald's fries go this way. So it's fascinating to see the process. And so, one of the things that I'm going to show you the model that I use in just a moment, because there is a model. Uh, unpredictable profits I just referenced. I find that most companies are not differentiating themselves. They're just another law firm. They're just another manufacturing company. They're just another whatever it might happen to be. In today's business climate, if you cannot differentiate your company, you are forced, in this economy, you're forced to price compete. And my experience is that's a dangerous game to play. Service is average at best. We're going to talk about service in just a moment. Cultures are not by design. How many of you have a well-designed, if I call on you, if we raise your hand, how many of you have a well-designed, strategically, by design, culture in your organization? Some? A few hands go up. Two to be exact. And I find alignment 
is an issue. Alignment with your employees, alignment with the company's values, alignment with your customers' needs today and your customers' needs three years from now, alignment with the priorities of the business, alignment with the talent required for the job. And so I find alignment to really be a business issue that most leaders don't really understand. So let me ask you a question. When you see the words on this screen, talent, recruiting, what the lobby of your business looks like, how the landscape out in front of your business looks, what your office looks like if a guest were to come in and look at your office, the margins, the recruiting, customer loyalty, turnover, promotions in the business, your prices, your phone system, who's responsible for all that stuff? If you had to guess, would anybody be willing to guess? The answer is you are. Yeah. <laughs> Leaders are. So I like to have fun. I'll make some of you laugh today. I might even upset one or two of you. The title of my book is The Answer is Leadership. What's the question? I don't care what question you're at. We can, serve, we can set up a panel up here. I can sit here and field questions all day long. And every question you will ask me will come back to a leadership issue. And so I put my 30 years of doing this uh, into a book that I'll reference from time to time this morning. I'm not here to sell books. I just put my story into something that you might want to learn from. So let's talk about developing talent for a moment. You have a piece of paper on your table, not the one with blanks. The other one says, does the right talent matter? And does developing talent have a powerful ROI? So pick up this handout for a quick second. There are no blanks. It's a front and back document. And just take 10 or 20 seconds and kind of glance over it. And then I'm going to ask you a question. Just glance over it. Flip it over, look at a couple on the back. So tell me your first impression glancing at it. Anybody want to speak up? If you don't, I'll call on you. It's all about people. It's all about people. What else, what other theme did you see when you were glancing at this? What's another theme or takeaway you would have? If you show this to 10 people and give them five minutes to read it, what are they gonna take away from this? The right talent really measures. You, some of you that have heard me talk, I reference A players and B players and C players and so on. Um, not all of these folks were hired into the organization with this talent. Most of you in this room could not afford to have an organization filled with A performers. You couldn't afford to buy them, you couldn't afford to recruit them, and maybe not even be able to afford to have them on your payroll the way you currently run the business. But I want you to see what great looks like. These are not just people who come to work and do their job. These people don't even all have titles as leaders, but every day their performance is extraordinary. This is what extraordinary looks like, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in. So there's a salesperson from Nordstrom's, there's something on here about surgeons, you name it. This is what great looks like. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through today's presentation. Anybody else have a takeaway? Going once? All right, nice quiet audience this morning, Jeffrey. So why do you think there's, how many of you have heard the saying, people are our greatest asset? How many of you have heard that? Right. How many CEOs in the room would say, and be careful before you raise your hand, that you have a budget that reflects that philosophy? See, people say that to me, and I'll ask them questions when I first meet people, and they'll tell me how important it is. Jeffrey's one of the few CEOs I've met in Michigan that actually puts into action spending money investing in the development of his culture and the development of his leadership team with some very thought out strategic actions, keyword actions. And that requires a budget. That requires a leadership decision that I want to invest in my talent that I already have so that they can perform at a higher level and make this a great place to work. And so on balance, turnover is pretty low in his organization. Unless people don't perform. And every once in a while, some tough decisions have to be made. We'll come back to that in just a moment. The real answer for this question is because leaders haven't made, you haven't made a decision to make developing leaders a business priority. 
you have, I'm going to say that again, you haven't made a decision to make your development, if you're an employee in this room, or your leadership team, you haven't put together a plan to develop your leaders. Because most leaders, you, I don't care where you can get an MBA from, but you can go get doctorate <laughs> degrees in America. There aren't many degrees today where one of the takeaways coming out of a university today is understanding how strategically, strategically to develop talent. And I'm going to show you how today. And with any luck at all, I'm going to get your attention as to why. So there's a chapter in the book that references this pyramid. Here's what this pyramid means to me. In my life, I run into occasionally, because I do it, it's my part of my business, I study companies that are the best of the best. Leading their industry. I don't care if you make machines that make automotive parts. I don't care if you're in the uh, uh, business of machining. I don't, I don't care if you're in security. If you're the best in your industry, meaning people aspire to be as great as your company is, that puts you in the top 8% in my pyramid. Then there's the 22% who are working at it. They're not there yet, but they are strategically developing the financial resources, they're bringing in outside experts, which will come back to another point, but they're strategically striving to be the best. And then there's the 7 out of 10, that if we were to offer to help them for free, they wouldn't let us. They had big egos. John, what do you know about running a doctor's office? Nothing, never ran one. But I've been responsible for physician education for over a thousand physician leaders and two healthcare systems. But whether you're running a healthcare office, whether you're running a Harley Davidson dealership, or whether you're running a pest control company and out of your garage rolls 10 trucks every morning, there are some business fundamentals that I spend 90% of my time helping business with master the fundamentals. Whoever wins the Super Bowl this year, when they come back to tr camp next year, they will open camp with blocking and tackling and running pass patterns and catching the ball properly, mastering the fundamentals. That's a takeaway I want you to have from today. And so today, if you're in the 22%, if you're in the 8%, I'd like to take you to dinner because I want to know what you're doing to stay there. So here's a slide that may shock some of you. I believe if you're a CEO or an executive sitting in this room, you have three choices. A, tolerate the way your business is currently being run, which means it's not going to change much. Number two, start to develop people in your organization, starting with leadership. And number three, the third option is you can buy talent. There are two good friends of mine sitting in the back of the room that own an executive search firm you can strategically understand how to leverage outside great resources like them if you know how to do it. And if you have the courage to reach out and let experts help you. Because here's a shocking statistic. In Michigan today, while we're sitting here, everybody who wants to work is working. Employment's kind of down right now. And those people who aren't working, you probably don't want on your team anyway. So it begs the question, if we're gonna share with you how to solve the recruiting and retention crisis in Michigan, but it's actually across America today, how do I do that? And I'm gonna share with you one decision that I think can solve both problems in the foreseeable future for your company, but you've gotta do it differently than you're doing today. So I believe you have three choices. Number one, tolerate, which means stop whining to me, just your business is gonna run like it's running and profits are gonna be up and down over time. Two, start strategically developing your talent you have, assuming you have the right talent, we'll come back to that in a moment, and or start strategically replacing some people that need to be replaced by going out and letting an expert go find you some rock stars to bring into your company. Those are your choices. There are no other choices in my, in my story. Here's the model that is in my book. Here's the model I coach all my businesses from. Number one, it starts with leadership. Oh, that's not a surprise, right? If you don't have the right leadership team, the future of your company is pretty predictable. I can tell you in about an hour what your profitability and revenues are gonna look like two or three years from now. Number two is focus on the talent, the employees, the associates in your organization. Do you have the right talent? Number three, the systems and processes necessary to be wildly successful. Number four, an obsession, there's that word, you saw an email from me the other day. An obsession 
about being extraordinary that every customer has a great experience when they work with your company. Before they do business with you, while they're doing business with you, and after they do business with you. The customer experience is a process, it's not an event. And so I can ask a bunch of questions, a lot of places in your organization. I can call your company, I can get my phone right now and dial your company and begin to tell you about what customers experience by how long it takes me to speak to a real person, for example. And then finally, being able to create a culture of true engagement. Because most of you could not stand up here and teach a class on engagement. It's not your strength. And it's also not the strength of your leadership team. And that's why we're sitting here talking about this topic today. So the question is, how do you do that? So let me share some things with you. So if you're gonna build a culture of engagement, who's gonna take the lead and how do you do it? What's the formula? So I'm gonna answer that for you in the next uh, 35 minutes or so. Also, all the speakers that participate in CBRT will take the opportunity while we share with you some things about business that we've learned to also weave into, uh, into, into this about our own personal testimony. So throughout this, I'm gonna to talk to you at some point about some things that are near and dear to my life, about my daughter, about my family, about my father, who made a really big influence on me. And with any luck at all, I won't get choked up. Um, but about my relationship with God and a couple tips I have for you about how you might take your relationship, your resume with God to maybe a, a next step up the ladder. Because I'm very proud of that. So, can culture be mattered? Can engagement be measured? Absolutely. Here are just three quick examples. So if you're wondering why should I change the way we're doing business today, these are business answers about why. This is kind of a simple slide. I think it's on the handout I gave you. Companies that have dynamic leadership that Jeffrey referenced in introducing me, across America, according to the research by Marcus uh, Buckingham and Kurt Kaufman, who used to work for Gallup, 33% more profitable. This isn't a fun fad, ladies and gentlemen. That book was written 10 years ago. And it's still true today as much as ever. It's just that most, or most leaders that sit in this room don't have the courage to make a new decision to begin to change the direction of their business because they're too busy. And that's a word I make fun of a lot. I, I make fun of two four letter words, busy and good. I talk to people all the time who are good and they're impressive and they can tell me all the great things they've done. But are they the best? Could they be more profitable? Could they be growing even better? Could they be working less hours? Somehow in America, we've put the word busy on a pedestal, as though it's impressive. I'm really busy. John, you don't realize how busy we are. I don't know why that is. Who, who, who put it up there? Because if I had my way, I'd like all of you to shift and put the word focused up there. Are you really focused? Because I'm really not impressed that you work seven days a week, 10 hours a day. That really doesn't impress me. I got a phone call yesterday from somebody who was introduced to me from a CPA firm and they wanted to talk to me about their sales staff and the way they were currently holding them accountable and and they had some measurable results and with a CPA firm they have big spreadsheets and I said well well John how do we do this and I said well what are you holding them accountable for he says results I said well are you getting the results yeah but he's not filling out all the forms I need him to fill out I said well you asked me so here goes and so we need to like rethink how we think about what's important. Because if you've got rock star salespeople, I don't want them sending faxes. I don't want them doing as little administrative work as possible. I want rock stars selling because that's what rock stars do. You ought to wash their car, fill it up with gas, because when they stop for six minutes and fill up gas, they're wasting six minutes. And to a rock star, that's a lot of money. To your profitability in your future, that's a lot of money. I want salespeople who are great at it selling as much as possible. I don't know if I'll ever hear from him again. He didn't seem to like my feedback, but <laughs> he was already kind of locked in on what he thought needed to be done. But the difference is, in my resume on the front cover of the book, I won the business coach of the year in North America four years in a row. I know what I'm talking about. He's never done it before. All right, so do you want to talk to a guy who's grown more businesses than any other coach in America for four years in a row out of 456 coaches 
Or do you want to listen to your C CPA who's never done this or sold something in his life? I'm nothing against CPAs. I have a lot of great friends that are CPAs. This particular one was kind of small thinking about how to help his client. So if you've never done it before, that's where that ego, that's why you're staying in the 70%. A couple of quick statistics that you had in there. I won't embellish on these very much. This is one of the Gallup studies. But here's the number I want you to see. 30%, seven out of 10 of your employees, according to a nationwide study of millions of people, are not fully engaged. Some of them are on vacation, they just come to work every day. A few of them have actually retired, they're still on your payroll, they just haven't told you yet. And you tolerate it, that's your fault, not theirs. They're gonna stay with you till they probably drop dead. Because they can. Jeffrey and I were talking about next year, because we listen to business trends all the time. I said to him, Jeffrey, I, I've had three or four themes emerge to me recently. We should consider this, adding it into our leadership series for next year. How to build a culture of performance and accountability. Performance and accountability. How do you do that? Like, could you write a book on that? If I call on you right now, could you stand up and tell us the four most important things that need to be done in the next seven days to start that evolution? So you may hear those words come out of this organization uh, in the next few months. So here's the model. So let's talk about leadership for a moment. I'm going to touch on all four around the outside and the customer briefly. According to Gallup, in the study last year, if they impact 70% of engagement in your organization, I think you should pay attention. Number two, Gallup finds that companies fail miserably, I added that word, to choose the right leadership talent 82% of the time. There's a whole chapter in the book about what I believe are the nine talent management systems to change this slide. Most of you do not really understand how to recruit and hire the right leadership talent, and Gallant proved it for me. 82% of the time, you're not very good at it. One in, lead, one in 10 leaders have high talent to effectively manage others. One in 10. How many are on your management team? Oh, John, our company's different. No, you're not. <laughs> Come on. No, you're not. Dave, how many leaders do you have in your company, roughly? Uh, 12. 12. How many do you have in your company? Uh, 15. Okay. And both of them are really nice guys. I actually sat at this table with this gentleman. I know Dave really well. And they're sitting, that's John, that's not true. Yes, it is. Maybe not one in ten, but do you have one in a key position that is costing you every day? Jeffrey and I were talking about a story about a vice president this morning in a company. Vice president. I'm kind of thinking he or she in any company ought to be able to make good business decisions, not be blindsided, not be in the dark. He was telling me a story about somebody. How many of you read the Jim Collins book years ago, Good to Great? And how many of you know that some of those great companies within 12 months after the book was written started to decline? In fact, some of them do not exist. So all of us are smarter after the fact. So he went out and put his research team together. I love research. And went back and started studying those great companies that started to decline because to be in that book, you had to be successful for a period of time and went back and started studying the bad ones, they started to fall. Why? Because all of us are smarter after the fact. So why did they start to decline? Here's one of the findings in the book. You ought to read the book. A declining proportion of key seats, leadership, filled with the right people now and for the future. That's the story of the book. Do you have the right leaders in the right seats See, here's where this gets even challenging. If I just kind of randomly call on people, you're not even sure what the right seats are. I mean, you'd have to give it some thought, and with enough time, you could probably make a list. But that would imply to me you're doing nothing about it. You don't have a plan. <coughs> and here's the interesting thought. In today's economy, remember that recruiting and retention crisis? In today's economy, your rock stars are being contacted by executive search firms. 
and you'll never know it. They are. I know at least three companies that own executive search firms. One's in Seattle, the two ladies back there, and one in Tampa. I got the United States covered. I got Michigan, Seattle, and Florida. All three of them are booming. Reaching into your companies, talking to your people about how'd you like to work at a place that's dynamic and fun and great performers are developed, you get compensated nicely, it's a great place to work compared to the place you're at. You wanna solve the retention crisis in your company for the future? Build a place that people would never wanna leave. See, that's the magic sauce. And I think there's one decision you need to make today in order to start down that path more strategically than you are today. So if we were to do an assessment, I've done this live when I have more times, I'll pass out three, I'm not gonna do this, I'll pass out three by five cards and I'll write A, B, C, D, and I'll ask everybody how many employees in your company or how many leaders in your company, and they'll fill in all the math. And here's what I, I've done this to probably 10,000 people in audiences, maybe more than that by now. Here's what people tell me. Generally speaking, about 10% of their leadership team are real rock stars. You can do this with your entire organization. This particular slide is about leadership, about 10%. About 20% are above average, meaning they do things more than, they do what's expected, and they do more without you telling them to. It's who they are. You do not want to lose these people. Now you're kind of wondering, but John, that's only 30%. Yeah? This number usually is more than half of a leadership team is average. Let me tell you what average means by my definition. They come to work, do their job, go home, and never do anything extra. They're just good, solid soldiers. They come to work, do their job, and go home. Now, is it important to have some solid soldiers, yes or no? Nod your head, yes. But you can't have a leadership team full of them. And so when you do the math, you've already figured out what the last number is, 10%. Now here's what's staggering about this. More, I've asked more than 10,000 people this question. The bottom answer and the top answer are almost always the same. Now, last year I became certified as a Vistage speaker in the Vistage CEO organization. And so now I'm starting to speak at some of their room full of CEOs like this. I did the same exercise, but we had three hours, so I asked them to fill in the blanks. Remember 10%, 10%, remember that? Watch this. Here's the flip chart from that exercise in a room full of CEOs 216, 217. If I did it with you, I'd get the same answers. The numbers would just be different, but the percentages are about the same. And Jeffrey knows I work hard at being a great Christian. This is a true live, I didn't make this up. Now here's the magic question. Why are these people still on the payroll? Amen. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is a leadership issue. Because more than likely, your culture, you didn't hire them as D performers. That's just kind of what they've involved in, evolved into over time. 70% of the organization is average or worse. Can this company expect long-term sustainable profitability, yes or no? No. Can this company expect to uh, pay out bonuses and have money for Christmas gifts? And can this company expect to be having extra money to do things with? Probably not. Occasionally, maybe, probably not. Do you think these people like working with these people? If, you knew, if you're really being honest, the answer is no. These folks like when these folks call in sick. <laughs> they do. These people really don't do very much. In fact, they take up an awful lot of time of their manager having to micromanage them. But why are they on the payroll? Do you realize what it does to profitability if you delete to either coach them up or coach them out? That's my next book, I think. <laughs> what if you replace 217, delete their payroll, go out and hire 109 B performers? 109, cut it in half. Don't go hire 217, because you don't really get all that much from these people anyway. You don't like the tone of the way these people talk to your customers on the phone. You don't really like their collaboration inside your organization. And on balance, on, a, on most days, they're kind of a virus. See, this isn't even scientific. You could walk back into your organization and say, hey, Scott, I went to this workshop this morning. This guy lit a fire under me. 
who are the one or two people that we need to let go around here? Bob and Connie. Like that. He knew the answer. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. You go to somebody else and say, hey, I was talking to somebody. Who are the two? Bob and Connie. And I'll go to Skip and I'll say, Skip, who are the two? Bob and Connie. Everybody knows who they are. They're just wondering why you haven't done something about it. Remember the three options? Tolerate or start to develop talent or be, and or begin to go out and buy higher quality talent. This company's gonna have a retention problem and this company's gonna have a recruiting problem. This is not a great place to work. It's not. What do these five people have in common? Other than the fact they're all males. Great athletes. Great athletes. What else? They make a lot of money. What else? Great leaders. Great leaders. What else? They've all been traded, let go, or not re-signed. Somebody had the courage to make a decision that says Miguel Cabrera is not in our company's future. We'll take that person instead. Thank you very much, by the way. <laughs> so was Wayne Gretzky, so was Brett Favre. I should add, was Peyton Manning on there? I should add Peyton Manning on there now. Do you have the courage to go take action about your company's results? But see, here's the problem. You can't tell me what your company's picture looks like because you don't have a good process to measure talent and to measure performance. That's a whole workshop for another day. I did a uh, survey with a company, we asked 33,000 executives across out of their database to fill out 10 or 15 questions on a survey. Um, I put it into this document, and one of the questions was, overall, what percentage of your entire management team would you rehire as top performers? 36% of 33,000 people, or whatever the number was that responded, said I would hire less than half if I had to do it all over again. I put all those questions and all that analysis and my recommendations for actions into this, and at the end of this workshop, if you send me a text, this will be in your inbox in 10 seconds. So I'm gonna give it to you for being here today. Less than half. Oh, John, that's not true for my company. That must be other companies. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the customer for a moment. How would you, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate service? How many of you eat at the same five or six restaurants most of the time? Most of us do, many of us do. And go to the same dry cleaners and get your hair cut at the same place and a variety of other things. How would you rate service in Michigan over the last five years? On a scale of one to 10, what number would you give service in Michigan? All industries. Three. Three? This is when you would speak? <laughs> five, Terry? <coughs> Three or four? Three? Six? Up here, another collaborating. Six. Six, what'd you say? Four. Four. Okay, so the high end was six and the low end was three. On balance, service in Michigan, service across America is poor. It is. And most of you don't understand that if you were to reinvent your culture, if you had the right leadership team, and if you made service to your customer, a business priority, if you knew how to do it, could this differentiate your company? When I say great service leaders in America, who comes to mind? Nordstrom? Maybe Disney? If you ask my wife, Zappos? There's a few, but there's not many. Who's the great service leader other than your company in the security industry? Can you think of one? No. Could his company be five times this big in the next five to 10 years if they were known for their service model? See, we've just become okay and complacent. That, that, well, that's what you get. You know, I go to the same restaurants. We expect pretty much the same food. We, we pretty much know what the service is gonna be like. And the prices are pretty fair. That's why we go there. But never is it extraordinary. It's just not. I, mean, I shouldn't have to chase people down to get my water refilled. Really? There's a lot of things that you could do in your business if leaders understood what actions to take. I talked about the customer experience. People will pay more for it when you create a great service model. And most of you probably think you're better than you really are, which begs the question, how could you go find out what your customers think of you? I have an entire service 
experience model training workshop built on this slide. It's called fill in the blank. What if, Dave, can I pick on you? Say yes, I'm, say yes, yes I'm yes, gonna. Yes. What if we know from the data, from the J.D. Powers Organization National Conference a couple years ago, that people will pay more for great service. We know that. However, what if, Dave is the example, what if you did what people pay you to do and fill in the blank? What if you did more than what? It might be a follow-up phone call. It might be a surprise about something. It might be some, I don't know what it might be, but what if your company could figure out, let's do what they pay us to do really great every day, but what if we did that and fill in the blank? Jeffrey, is your industry competitive, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. And so doing a great job is really important. But what if in addition to a great job, he also became known for fill in the blank? That's an interesting question for you to ponder with your management team. Let's talk about talent for a minute. I've already covered this briefly. One of the truths in my book, there's a chapter that has 18 truths that I believe about, lead, in, about business today. High performers do not like working with average performers. When somebody isn't doing something, and we talk about, well, what's an average performer? What's a high performer? How do you get people to perform at their best? Here is a list of the places you need to look to find out why someone isn't performing at the level you want them to perform at. Do they have the right commitment? Do we have clear performance expectations? Usually you think you do, but when, we, when I go ask them, it's not so clear. Lack of skill or ability, training can help there. Maybe we don't have the right person in the job. Carry is fit important when you place people into organizations. Yeah. It's like everything. It's everything. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Is it a productive or unproductive work environment? We were sitting last night having a conversation, and they were telling me about a visit they recently had with, at Zingerman's, for example. What a great place to work. And they don't even pay at the top of the range of when they fill openings. They really don't. It's that. Disney pays less for entry-level jobs than Burger King in Orlando. How do you know that? Because I've studied, I've gone behind the scenes at Disney. I understand a lot about how they think about bringing talent in there. They don't go there because of more money. They don't. Zingerman's may pay less in some instances than other businesses, but it's the Zingerman culture. People want to work there. They don't have a retention problem. They don't even have a recruiting problem. People stand in line to want to work there. That may not be so true for your company. But do you know what to do about it? There's one decision you need to make when you leave here today that can begin to change that answer. So let's talk about some solutions for a moment. Number one, you need a master plan. That's kind of quick, and I'm probably not surprising you, but most of you don't have a, a plan for developing talent in your organization. Number one, you need to find out if you have the right leaders. Well, how do you do that? Well, one thing you might do is conduct an assessment. There are 10 million assessment tools out in the marketplace. This just happens to be one that I like. And so you start asking with data, not people's opinion or how well they interview, can the person do the job? How well will they do the job? And will they want to do the job? So if you had this kind of information about people, if we did an assessment, we would create these blue boxes. These are ranges of high levels of performance. Then we ask them to take the assessment. This is how this person scored. They're almost always in the blue. This person's gonna be a great fit. Yes, they can do it and they will want to do it. Wouldn't that be great data to have about your leadership? It's an, it's an MRI and a CAT scan all in one. There are other tools out there you can use. You can use Myers-Briggs instruments. You can use a DISC instrument. And all those have a place and a role to play. I've used them. This is much more sophisticated. This, this particular tool, a little bit pricey, this will stand up in court and has. It's that statistically valid. So be careful when you start using assessments. Make sure you pick one that's a great assessment. Anybody in here know how to play Euchre? OK, I worked my way through college. <laughs> I went to Eastern Michigan primarily to play ball. 
and school was just something I had to do, and I had a lot of downtime uh, from time to time, so I sat in the union and played euchre. I became really good at it. Do you know how to play euchre? Uh, how do you teach a brand new person? So, are you married? Okay, you and your wife are working, or another couple come over, and they want to learn how to play, but they've never seen the game. How do you teach someone how to play euchre? Lay the cards out. So you tend to open them up, you feel them around, and then you start saying, and now you start explaining Bowers. And why is this card of a diamond higher than this card? Of, and you start trying to explain it, right? So in business today, most of you don't have a very good process for onboarding new talent and for training and developing new talent or existing talent in your organization. And Euchre is such a fun game because it's kind of simple, yet when you try and teach someone, it kind of begs the question, what's the best way to teach them? And the answer, generally speaking, is experience. We're just going to play a few hands, and then we're not going to open them up, and we're going to try it, and you're going to lay a diamond down on a heart when you should have played. And, and so people will make some mistakes, and eventually they'll start to learn it. Now let's go to chess. Ooh, more robust. If I passed out a chess game to every player in this room, and you open it up and set it all up, a masterful chess player can walk up to you and move this person, and walk up to the game in front of you and move this person, walk up to your game and move this. And in a matter of a short bit of time, a masterful chess player will win every game against every one of you, playing 90 games simultaneously. They're that good. That's what masterful competence looks like. What percentage of all your employees work at 100% capacity and efficiency? Wouldn't it be interesting to know? Because if the number's not 100, and I promise you it's not, in fact, I'll promise you it's not remotely close to 100, it's probably somewhere in this space, it begs the question, how do we help them improve their performance? How do we help them become more proficient faster at Euchre? How do we speed up the learning curve? Because onboarding in most organizations and training and development in most organizations is a joke. You have no strategic process at all. And so let me show you an example of what great looks like. So let's talk about time to proficiency. So they come into your organization here. How fast can we get them up to being a solo performer at a really high level? A or B performer, and how much time does that take? And what I'm about to show you statistically has been proven that you can take your current model and improve it by as much as 30 to 50% if you decide to do it differently. Let me show you what differently looks like. What information do people need? So for the moment, let's talk about a brand new employee. You bring them into your organization. And in Jeffrey's organization, there's safety things they got to learn, and you got to learn, you got to watch this video, and you got to fill out all these forms, and you got to read the policy manual. We'll leave you alone in the room for a day. We'll come back and wake you up, but you got to read the policy manual. And, <laughs> I'm not making that up, Jeffrey. But, but that's what companies do. Most companies' onboarding process is boring and ineffective. But what if you could answer the question, what information do people need, when do they need it, and what's the best way for people to learn it? So in Jeffrey's organization, Jeffrey, is safety important in your company? Absolutely. Critically important. And so you watch all these safety videos on day two. But it's not till day 193 where you have to put on that mask and the oxygen and go into a confined space. What was that video I watched 183 days ago? How do I do that? And so giving people the right information at the right time is also part of the process. What if you could take Day one, they graduate from whatever onboarding process you designed after you left here today. And the way up here, they become independently proficient. A great project manager, for example, Jeffrey. Unfortunately, in most organizations, what happens here to, whoops, what happens between here and here is a mystery. People just hang out and go watch Bob, and hang out with Bob, and go to lunch with Bob, and stand and watch Bob. And if you have a great memory, and assuming Bob is a rock star to begin with, because heaven forbid, they're watching somebody who's not, that opens up a whole other discussion. 
You ever been to a bank and a brand, a brand new bank teller is in front of you? Well, you're getting to watch someone learning how to play you here because they're trying to figure out what they do and the sequence to do it. This mystery period is filled with waste and variability and it's really unstructured. What if you could create a learning path model that says we could actually map this out? We could actually, when it comes to safety, speed, quality, productivity, we could actually do this far faster and more effectively if we had a process. It's called a learning path. What if we created a series of learning opportunities that's very well mapped out that has people learn? And one of the best ways to learn new occurs by experience. Most of learning occurs from experience. Classroom learning helps, mentoring helps, coaching helps, online learning helps, so there's lots of methodologies to support it, but most learning occurs from experience. But most of your experiences in your company aren't organized. And so how would leaders begin to integrate into your company and improve their training and their productivity if we could map out the learning process from where they are to where you'd like them to be? And if you map it out, you can improve as much as 30 to 40% of their productivity quicker with higher productivity as well. And so here's what it might look like. I'm just trying to paint a picture. This isn't an actual map, but here's what it might look like. Over time, what do people know, need to know? When do they need to know it? And how should we best give it to them? Because the answer for everything isn't an online module. Some people actually don't learn very well in online modules. The answer for everything isn't classroom learning. That contributes, that helps. It's not the only answer. It's a blended approach to knowing how to do this. Here's what it looks like when you put it into a cycle. Define the proficiency. For some of you, that would be work in and of itself. Map out the path. Look for opportunities to improve it the way you're doing it today. Upgrade it, which means make some edits once you've modified it. Begin to build the activities for it and then implement it and test and measure and see, is it working? It's a strategic mapped out process for learning to capability, adding more capability in your organization in a more strategic way. So that's an example of how to bring leaders into your organization, because if you sat down with a high quality vice president that you're considering bringing into your company and you show them the process that they're gonna go through for proficiency, they're gonna be kind of like blown away. Because I promise you, they don't, they're not coming from an organization where that's true, and they don't really understand how to do that. And so your culture and your attention to developing them looks far more sophisticated than the company they're considering leaving. So one of the ways to improve the recruiting process is to have a better mapped out process for how to develop talent coming into your company. I promise you it'll change questions and it will also change the quality of people coming into your organization. And most of you know the statistics. I spoke at the University at Michigan State's Business School a few months back on the subject of how to attract and retain millennials, half of your workforce is gonna be millennials by 2020. Half of all your employees are gonna be millennials. And they care about development. You don't figure that out, you won't keep them. Five years from now, your company's financial performance is gonna look different because you couldn't figure out how to do what you heard back on August 19th, way back in 19, back in 2016. I promise you this is the future of your company. The question is, are you gonna lead in your industry, in your marketplace, or are you just gonna be another casualty? Whoops. Um, one of the ways to recruit and retain great leaders in today's workplace is to make sure that people are getting accurate feedback. And feedback comes from a variety of ways. One of the nuggets up there talks about feedback from a culture survey. Here's a sample of a report that we recently did with the company. We did a culture survey. And so we asked all their employees what it's like to work here. Now, do you think this is feedback about leadership by department or by business unit? Do you think this would be good feedback to have about what employees think about what it's like to work here? This is a great recruiting and retention tool because it'll show us what people like about working in your company. And now you've got real data about what are some areas that could be improved. And so when you look at strengths versus, would it be valuable to have this report for your organization? 
Well, see, it takes a different kind of commitment because it costs a few dollars. It's not very expensive, but it's a form of feedback. Your turnover statistics is a form of feedback. Various assessments. I showed you one assessment a few minutes ago. We could do 40 assessments. We wouldn't, but I mean, there are lots of them out there. Is a form of feedback. Their performance feedback. Are they doing the job at a high level? And so on. So you can read the rest of these. Here's another example of a scorecard that we use. We put all that into a metric scorecard. This is an example of what that culture survey may look like. This is one of the pages out of that report. Make career development a part of your accountability system because then people will take development seriously when you hold people accountable for it. Here's a sample of a development plan. And here's some examples of how to develop talent in your organization. When you develop talent, just a couple last slides, think about people in their current position, think about their next possible assignment, think about development from the team perspective, and what does it relate to in terms of their career goals? Where do we think that controller could be in five years in our organization? Could they be the next CFO? And last but not least, you need to read this book. It's a research project for companies your size. It's called Breakthrough Company by Keith McFarland. He studied great companies that are mid-sized companies, not Fortune 100 companies. And in the book, one of his findings, what did the seven companies do above all their competition? They used outside experts better than their competition. So here's my offer to you. You have a small feedback form on your table that is probably yellow. Would you be nice enough to fill it out and get out your phone as I wrap up? If you would like to talk to me, please print on the form. If you would like to talk to me, there's some boxes at the bottom, it's yellow. If you would like to talk to me. Now let me share something with you. I am thrilled to be standing in front of you this morning for a number of reasons. Number one, I admire Jeffrey more than you'll ever know as a Christian, as a friend, as a business person who strives every day and puts his pocketbook where his mouth is. He is really taking developing talent seriously. Um, I have had the pleasure of being mentored for a long time from my father, uh, who was born and raised in the South, and a Christian. And so I grew up with what most of you would probably call old-fashioned values. And one of those values was get up and go to church every Sunday morning. So my folks were from Alabama. And um, there's a park, he never even graduated from high school because his parents passed away. There's a park in Melvindale, Michigan that's got my father's name on it um, because he was a giver. And so one of the things I would ask you, so I grow up not knowing any other, why wouldn't you just give? Why wouldn't you help people? And so it's funny that God kind of led me into a path where that's what I get to do every day. It's who I am and it's what I do because I was raised with those values. And one of my values is trying to encourage people to be the best they can be. And in this room, in this audience, I've had the privilege of, of knowing Christ for 30 plus years in my lifetime. And there's been periods of my time where I probably wasn't as good a role model as I should have been. But in the last five years, um, I've changed who I hang out with. I now serve on the board of CBRT. I get the privilege of working with Jeffrey and some of the other great people in this room. And, and one of the things I would just share with you as you think about your Christianity and how you get to contribute is we all have a reputation. Every person in this room has a brand. I would just ask you to pay particularly close attention to the resume you're building because there's going to come a day when he's going to call you home. And I would ask you to be ready for that. And a simple action you could take from being here this morning, because I'm a huge nut about take action, is I would ask you to take seriously how you get involved in this organization. Uh, Skip and I have gotten to know each other in the last couple months. He's bringing people here today. There's no reason every one of you in this room couldn't bring four or five people to the next quarter event, to go to the smaller monthly breakout conversations, to invite some guests, and be okay with telling them about your Christianity and your belief in God and, and <clears throat> how you believe in the heavens. And, but don't be so quiet about it. I'm kind of a slow learner. It took me until about 50. And, and so now I'm really proud to tell everybody and I do it regularly. And I stand in front of audiences and talk about it and oftentimes get kind, of, get kind of broke up. But it started with my dad, who just, as a young boy, just said that's, that's the way we live. And so I would encourage all of you in your own journey, in your own relationship, in your own brand, your own re resume with God, 
to uh, think long and hard about, don't wait till someday, really be a great, great contributor. And this is such a dynamic, we could fill, we could outfill this room if every one of you brought three or four people next time. And so I'll leave you with this thought. If you'd like to talk to me, you can come up and get one of my business cards. I'm gonna put this on the screen and Jeffrey's gonna close. Um, you should have filled out your answers on those 10 slides if you were taking notes. If you didn't, send me an email, I'll send you the answers. <laughs> or cheat from the person next to you. But here's, what I'm gonna, here's my gift to you. If you send me a text before you leave today to this number, put your first, last name, and email address, that's all, just send me a text, then this document will be sent to you uh, via, you'll have it before you get to your car. So on behalf of CBRT and the board and all the great Christians that are in this room, thank you so much for the opportunity today. I really hope you t make a decision to start developing your leaders at a far different pace than you have in the past. Jeffrey. Thank you for watching this presentation. Perhaps you've never made a Christian commitment. We want to give you that opportunity today. Just a few easy steps. First of all, recognize your need. The Bible tells us that in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners and must recognize our need for a Savior. By confessing our sins and turning from them, we will find forgiveness. The Bible promises in 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believe in Jesus. God wrought a miracle when he sent his only son to die that we might have life. Put your faith in him and believe in his power to save you. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God has given us a great gift in his son, but we must receive this gift. Thank him for loving and forgiving you and ask him to live in your heart. His promise to us is clear. In John 1.12, the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus is the atonement, the sacrificial lamb, the remission of sins, just as if we'd never sinned, and the forgiveness. Through Jesus, we have daily forgiveness. And having received his salvation, confess your faith, the Bible assures us in Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, we're all going to die and spend eternity somewhere, either in heaven or in hell. We want to give you the opportunity to pray with us today. Let's bow our head. Lord, I recognize my need for you as my Savior. I confess my sins to you now, and I turn from them, and I ask for your forgiveness, Lord. I believe in you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me, that I might have eternal life with you in heaven. Lord Jesus, I receive you now in my heart and I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you receive me into your kingdom. I believe in my heart that you are my Lord and that God raised you from the dead, that I might be saved and spend eternity with you. I thank you, Lord, 
that I am now part of God's family and I commit my life to you from this day forward. Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer with us, we encourage you to share that with someone today. Thank you.